Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome again back to the uh, now the second panel of this uh, symposium. I'm Frank Gannon. I'm the moderator. Uh, I'm going to try not to be intimidated by the presence of Susan B. Anthony over my shoulder. Uh, but if she moves, let me know. There's, um, we have a lot of ground to cover with Nixon's uh, uh, programs and legislation. And so the, uh, as a very brief overview uh, of the method to my madness this morning, uh, we'll begin with an overview of the situation in 1969-1970 when Nixon is inaugurated, and then um, talk about the role, the pivotal role, of the game-changing role of Barbara Franklin, and then look at women's issues, Nixon and women's issues, through the rubric of civil rights, uh, which he applied uh, directly, so uh, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, the Affirmative Action, uh, Woman on the Supreme Court, Title IX, and then uh, the legislation, uh, particularly the Family Assistance uh, Plan, the Child, the Comprehensive Child Development Act of uh, 1971, and then the uh, Equal Opportunity Credit Act of 1974. We have a uh, distinguished panel. Uh, first is uh, Su uh, Susan Hartman. Uh, Susan is a, uh, Professor Hartman, is an Arts and Humanities Distinguished Professor of History Emerita at Ohio State University. She has published extensively on women in the 20th century, fem feminism, and women's rights movements. Among her books are From Margin to Mainstream, American Women and Politics Since the 1960s, and uh, The Other Feminists, a study of women's rights activism in the 1960s and 1970s. I believe that her textbook, The American Promise, now in its seventh edition, is assigned by Dean Kotlowski in some of his classes. Uh, she is uh, an elected uh, fellow of the American Society of Historians. Uh, Dean Kotlowski is professor of history at Salisbury University uh, and was the 2022 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at the Australian National University. His book, Nixon's Civil Rights, Politics, Principle, and Policy, was published by Harvard University Press in 2002. And Abigail, do we see her? There she is, hi. <laughs> Abigail Malangoni is, the, is an archivist at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. Uh, I looked, I checked the weather in Cambridge, I think today is 43 and rainy, so not only do we wish you were here, but I'm sure you wish you were here. Uh, I do. She's uh, been an archivist with the National Archives and Records Administration for the past 14 years, uh, first working at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library before joining JFK in 2013. Prior to her work with NARA, she worked for the Winthrop Group in New York City. Abigail received her MS in Library and Information Science from Long Island University. She is an associate lecturer at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and serves as a representative at large for the New England Archivists. Apropos today's uh, program, she was the archivist who uh, uh, processed the Barbara Franklin collection of papers. And uh, last but not least, John Roy Price retired, is the retired uh, president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. During the first Nixon administration, he was special assistant to the president uh, and executive secretary of the Council for Urban Affairs and the Council for Rural Affairs. He's the author of The Last Liberal Republican, uh, an insider's perspective on Nixon's surprising social policy. So it's a, it's a very distinguished panel that combines, as I think the archivist said in her introductory remarks, it combines uh, first-person experience, archival expertise, uh, archival knowledge, and then academic expertise. So it, it, it covers every base, and uh, I think it's going to be very exciting. Uh, in the mid and late 1960s, America experienced the greatest cultural, social, and political uh, upheaval since the Great Depression, since, since the Civil War. And in, just as in 1861, just as in 1933, in 1968, America was at a tipping point. Could implode, could explode, uh, but it was certainly ready for radical change. Uh, 
That was the context when Richard Nixon was sworn in as the 37th president on January 20th, 1969. Although his 1972 49 state landslide victory was one of the two or three great landslides in our electoral history, his 1969 margin was razor thin. And he was the first president in 120 years since Zachary Taylor not to have at least one House of Congress controlled by his party for at least any part of his term as president. So in judging or in analyzing ju ju and judging Nixon's uh, political domestic, particularly his domestic political record, I think it's very important to remember the, the uh, constraints uh, on him and on what he could do. He couldn't, he couldn't guarantee that bills would pass and he couldn't fund them. So um, there was a limit on what he could, on what he could actually do. Nixon's years in office, particularly 69 to 73, have been called the peak years of feminist activism. Uh, in 1969, Harvard professor, Kennedy administration official, and Nixon advisor, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, wrote uh, in a memo to President Nixon in his inimitable style. Moynihan wrote, female equality will be a major cultural political force in the 1970s. The essential fact is that we have educated women for equality in America but have not really given it to them, not at all. Inequality is so great that the dominant group either doesn't notice it or assumes the dominated group likes it that way. I would suggest that you take advantage of this in your appointments, as you have begun to do, but perhaps especially in your pronouncements. This is a subject ripe for creative political leadership and initiative. So the president and his White House were uh, aware of the winds of change and were ready for change. And perhaps, Susan, you could uh, give us a sense, of, an overview of the, the context, the lie of the land, uh, generally, in 69, 70, as Nixon becomes president. When Nixon became president, um, traditional ideas about women uh, still were really quite dominant. Uh, that their primary role was in the home um, as wife and mother. Um, in reality, though, um, more than a third of all women worked outside the home at that time, um, and about a third of all women uh, were in college. Um, they did not have high positions generally um, in terms of um, the professions, for example, um, women received or earned um, only about 5% of all law degrees in the late 60s and um, about 10% of all, and about 10% of all, sorry, <laughs> of all medical degrees. Um, women worked very hard in the political parties um, at, the, at the grassroots level, holding coffees and uh, canvassing, getting people to the polls, but very few held high p political office, uh, or even, for that matter, low political office. Um, about 10% of all school board members, where you'd expect to find women, about 10%, only about 10% were women uh, in 1970. They were um, fewer than 5% of all state legislators. Um, there were 11 women in Congress when Nixon was president. Um, five of them were Republicans. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith, the only senator, um, and, and four representatives who I want to talk about a little bit later because I, I find them to be really crucial to what went on in terms of women's policies during the Nixon administration. Um, there, was, there were some stirrings in the 60s. The civil rights movement, for example, caused people to think about rights in, in general. Um, there were two key pieces of legislation that preceded Nixon's uh, initiatives, the title of the uh, Equal Pay Act of 1963 and the law of 1964 banning sex discrimination in employment. And a new women's movement was just getting underway. The National Organization for Women, or NOW, the major feminist organization, was founded in 1966. Yet when Nixon was inaugurated, it still had fewer than 5,000 members. The National 
uh, Women's Political Caucus was not founded until 1971. So out of this um, uh, period of uh, lots of traditional um, ideas about women, traditional roles for women, um, but, but some changes, came a handful of women who um, I would argue were uh, absolutely critical to what happened during the Nixon administration. And maybe I'll let some of my fellow panelists talk for a while before we come back to them. Um, when uh, FDR was the first, oops. FDR was the first president to appoint a uh, woman uh, to the cabinet, Frances Perkins, as Secretary of Labor. And then Eisenhower in 1953 appointed Avita Kulpabi as uh, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. President Truman appointed 20 women to positions requiring Senate confirmation. Uh, Eisenhower appointed 28, and President Kennedy 27. So there was some precedent, but the precedent was not very prepossessing. Uh, and as we've heard, as the archivist in her uh, introductory remarks mentioned, uh, the reporter, uh, Vera Glaser, stood up at the press conference and asked, uh, spoke truth to power, I guess, and said, why uh, of the 200 appointments that had been made so far, only three were women? And that got Nixon's attention, uh, to put it mildly, and he appointed a task force, as we've heard, on women's rights and responsibilities. Uh, and they reported their, re their report uh, in December of 69, called the Matter of Simple Justice, uh, was, uh, very important. Uh, you, you mentioned the, that uh, the 64 Pay uh, Act, uh, in, uh, I think in July of 1970, the Justice Department, the Nixon Justice Department, for the first time brought a suit uh, under that uh, for, for, for discrimination and pay against women. So there was some movement, but the really game-changing moment, the pivotal moment, was when Barbara Franklin was uh, joined the White House staff in April of 1971. And in Abigail, we have the uh, the person who knows that inside out, upside down. So Abigail, can you enlighten us on uh, Barbara Franklin's pivotal role? I would be happy to. So quite a lot of time actually elapsed. Oh, am I? I, I'm not muted on my end. Still um, muted. Better fix this or Susan B. Anthony will be on the, <laughs> on the march. How about now? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so it's, it's it's good to note that quite a lot of time actually elapsed between Nixon's inauguration and the appointment of Barbara Franklin to that position. So the wheels of social change are always very slow. Um, but the one thing that the White House um, and the Nixon administration seemed really comfortable with one of the suggestions from the um, task force report was the recruitment of women to high level positions in government. Um, so pretty much right before Franklin started, uh, Nixon issued a directive to departments and agencies, um, making them come up with an action plan about how they were actually going to hire women. And the very next day, the official press release went out that Barbara Franklin was hired um, and her title at the time was staff assistant for executive manpower. Um, and so, as you can imagine, at the time, the manpower portion of this did not go over very well with women's groups. Um, so that it was shortened shortly thereafter to just staff assistants. Um, but the goals had been set. So she came in and her charge was she had to double the level of high level appointments in the government so those are your real policy making um positions um if you are in government as i am that's a gs16 position um if you want some numbers there um so in addition to that they had to double that from 26 positions to 52. they had to significantly increase the number of women in the mid-level position so about uh those are like gs 13 to 15 positions, and also a 0.25% of posts on advisory boards and commissions to women. Um, so Franklin really hit the ground running. Um, she became uh, important working with um, the staff of these agencies to really make viable action plans for how this was going to happen. Um, and it truly wasn't asking that much. Um, 
most agencies just had to commit to hiring one or two women in these roles. The largest were uh, state and um, Hugh, health education and welfare, and they had three people. So she was really working with them to set up viable goals that could be achieved and then had to really come up with a system for how to find these women, how to recruit these women. Um, so she started to amass a talent bank of, um, I think by a couple months in, she had 300 names on that list um, where she got information from various women groups. She really acts as a liaison. She traveled, she spoke with groups. Um, she received resumes from people themselves who are looking for a job or people who had been recommended. Um, and in her papers here, there's a great uh, file index where it kind of lists all these people uh, what they were doing, their skills, their qualifications. Of course, very important to politically vet them at the time as well, because um, although Nixon did want the best person for the job, he also wanted them to agree philosophically with him. So that was an important part as well. Um, and then had to go work with the liaisons um, to find out what vacancies there were, um, what the qualifications needed, what skills were needed. Um, so then she could go back, find um, an appropriate woman for that post, and then kind of sell them to the agencies and departments. Um, and it's important to note, it's true at the time, unfortunately, it's true today that for women to be considered for these positions, they already had to be overqualified um, to get that same opportunity. So anyone who did receive an appointment during this time had already overachieved um, by the, and then she continued this. It wasn't recruitment was of course a full-time job and she was able to actually hire two staff members to assist her with that, who were both women. Um, and, but she also became a very visible presence in the Nixon administration for this work. Um, she also oh, maybe stepped out of what the zone she was originally supposed to be in um, to just work really on women's women's issues and advocate for them in the White House. Um, she wrote memos, she spoke with groups and passed on their feedback to the administration. Um, and one thing she became very involved in was the 1972 election. Um, because especially at that period, they didn't want to lose the women vote. And at this time, women were really coalescing across party um, social economic lines in this quest for female equality. And she was very adamant that this could not be ignored. She suggested to have women speakers. She pushed for a keynote speaker who was a woman at the Republican National Convention, uh, which was eventually achieved with Ann Armstrong, who was actually the first woman to um, speak at any party's um, convention. Um, so without her really kind of continuing to push this envelope, um, this wouldn't really have been possible um, for the administration to get the numbers that she did. By the time she left, um, there was 105 women in those high policy positions, um, over 1,100 women in those mid-level positions. Um, and forgive me if I said this already, I've lost, I forgot if I mentioned it, but the people who were in these positions were very often the first time these positions were held by women, which was really important because previously when personnel was asked to look for women, um, they just didn't have any jobs that they thought were uh, appropriate for women. So really anytime a woman left, they would try to replace her with a woman, uh, but not have her go kind of outside of that box. So that was really important stride as well. Um, and uh, I'm glad Frank mentioned all of the comparison with the administrations that came before. And so the numbers are truly remarkable. And the administration really did more for women in government than anyone had ever done up until that point. But I think it really took Barbara Franklin to get those floodgates opened and importantly it, it didn't just become a policy to hire women anymore it became a practice and that started with her not to put words in your mouth but not to put words in your mouth but uh, you said that one of the or i hear you saying that one of the things she uh, did at the beginning was to assemble binders of women okay uh, <laughs> The, uh, in addition to uh, the, the, the executive level jobs you mentioned, I think during this time, there were the first women, I think six general officer, army generals, officers, uh, first sky marshals, first secret service agents. I mean, it opened a lot of, of and as you say, a lot of them were first time jobs. Uh, it, it really, I mean, it wasn't, it could have been more. Uh, but it was a, a real, real important start. Do you know how, uh, how did Barbara Franklin come to the White House? How did she come to Nixon's attention? 
So she, uh, a very prominent woman and a successful woman in her own right. Uh, but one of the things that got her in the door um, at the time, Fred Malik was in charge of kind of this personnel um, drive and he knew Franklin from Harvard Business School. Um, so it really goes to show and knew of her capabilities. So it goes to show that it's really important for women to be in these type of rooms to get the kind of attention that they need to be brought on. Um, so Malik was really the one instrumental in bringing her over. And a, a six month leave of absence for her from Citibank turned into two years with the administration. Uh, we have a picture, I think, of. Uh which you may have seen before already, of Barbara Franklin in, uh, with Fred Malik in the Oval Office, uh, I think on the, her first day on the job with Nixon. And there it is. And uh, then there's a, another picture of, uh, which I think is from the same period of Nixon in the Oval Office with some of his uh, high-level women appointees. Uh, and, and uh, I think of particularly of the uh, task force on, on women's rights and responsibilities. Uh, yep. And then there's uh, one in the, uh, this is from 1969, and then there's one from 1972, I think, in the Rose Garden of uh, a number of, uh, of the high-level uh, women appointees. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, so moving along. Thank you, Abby. We'll come. You know, we'll have a. Any questions for Abby? From uh, the in in terms of actual policy and legislation, Nixon approached uh, women's issues largely, uh, partly, and largely through the rubric of civil rights. And so, uh, Dean, can you talk us talk to us about? And that includes the Equal Rights Amendment, the appointment of a woman to the Supreme Court, uh, affirmative action, Title IX, among other things. Can you sort of walk us through that? I think, uh, Frank, the emerging picture that we're having here is of an administration that got off to a rather slow start in the area of women's rights, and then it picked up steam, and it established ultimately a, a strong record, probably more pluses than minuses. So it's, it's interesting. I have a little anecdote that I wanted to start out with. Um, this comes from some, uh, a meeting summary by a presidential aide, John Andrews, August of 1971, so just after Barbara Franklin joined and made her tremendous impact. Uh, according to Andrews, Richard Nixon had to be, quote, dragged kicking and screaming into the state dining room, end quote, to address the American Legion Auxiliary Girls' Nation. Uh, he called this a hardship assignment to tell the president he had to do this, but the president soon warmed to his audience and he called women a great human resource, those were his words, and proclaimed, quote, there should be no bars to women's achievement and contribution. Perhaps one of you will even occupy this office. That can and should happen, end quote. He also lauded homemakers, telling his audience that, quote, you can do as much, perhaps more, as a good woman, end quote. So what you can see here is that he, during the Nixon years, there's an emerging social movement that the men in the administration and at the top level was all men were not prepared for. And when pushed, what they came up with was, was the principle of, of equal rights, you know, of opportunity, um, a very American principle, but also very much a Republican Party principle. Um, and uh, uh, the politics, I think, is also very important here as well. Um, I have a document here that I'm going to read, and I wasn't planning to do much reading of documents, but I found this in the archives this week. And again, it's in the, Abby, it's in pre-Barbara Franklin era. This is 1970, and it's a proposal to John Ehrlichman to have a small dinner for women serving in the administration. And it's the top eight women serving. And political aides Pat Buchanan, Charles Colson, Rogers Morton, who was the chair of the Republican National Committee, we're all in favor of this. Colson says, quote, we are missing an opportunity in this area as well as allowing a negative issue to develop. There is no single area which would be more responsive and would result in so many political pluses at so little cost, end quote. And Morton's quote, I think, is even more interesting. And these are his words at the end. They're not mine. Uh, Morton says, quote, we've been fighting pretty much a of a losing battle on this subject of the recognition of women in this administration. The top women's organizations are beginning to unite in their promotion of the Equal Rights Amendment. 
and they are beginning to believe that only, and only is all in caps, only the Democrats are interested. Here's his closing sentence. The gals have a tremendous influence on the outcome of any election, end quote. And I'm holding this up. You see Ehrlichman checked yes to have this. So I think that this is very um, interesting. The, the political dimension certainly was there. Uh, another document, Fred Harris, Democratic senator from Oklahoma, tells Nixon it's time to appoint a woman to the US Supreme Court. And they were unable to do that, but it entwined with the issue of the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, Nixon had supported the Equal Rights Amendment since his days in Congress. You might be surprised to know that the Equal Rights Amendment was much older than the 1960s. It went back to 1923, in terms of when it was first introduced. And Susan can kind of correct me on this, maybe in the, the more general discussion, but it actually was a little bit more of a Republican issue than a Democratic issue. The Democratic Party was very much tied to protective legislation that the ERA would have gotten rid of. So it wasn't surprising that Nixon supported it. By 1968, all National Party candidates supported the ERA, but it was more or less pro forma. And you see the movement starting, and especially the movement for the ERA starting in the, early the late 60s and early 70s. So Nixon had an idea, he and his staff, they would make, and pardon the the sports analogy, a double play for women's rights. Thinking again, largely of the politics, but not exclusively the politics. Uh, do a re-endorsement of the ERA in 1971 when he has the opportunity with the Supreme Court. And thinking he could appoint a woman and make a really big splash. Well, they were unable to find a woman who the American Bar Association would support. So they didn't, they, they appointed Rehnquist and Lewis Powell and there was a little bit of delay in endorsing the Equal Rights Amendment. A lot of the members of the staff felt, you know, that his past endorsements were sufficient. Very interesting, though. Pat Nixon supported the ERA, and Julie Nixon Eisenhower sent him a little note saying, Dear Daddy, please re-endorse the ERA. It's very important, and we lose the votes of women if you don't endorse it. So she knew the way to her father's heart, in a way. Um, I, I think, though, in terms, what's very interesting about this, so the ERA never, it, it passes the House and the Senate. A president doesn't have to sign it. It is never ratified. But there are other things that the Nixon administration did, especially in the area of female employment. And Frank, you know, and Nixon scholars know, one of the most interesting documents are the annotated news summaries. And you can get all sorts of stuff in those annotated news summaries. Well, very early on in a news summary, a, a group called American Women in Television and Radio urged Nixon, this is an item in his news summary, was urging the appointment of a woman to the Federal Communications Commission. Nixon scrawled in the margin, why not? So, you know, there you go, right? And we're hearing a lot about Barbara Franklin and the importance, and also setting numerical targets. Uh, when the Interior Department said, we're gonna hire 20 women, uh, Fred Malik, standing behind Franklin, said, why not 50? So she had that kind of support but even more important than women in government, that's one, one part of this triad, were employment of women in firms that had government contracts, affirmative action. The administration started this with the Philadelphia Plan for Minority Groups, racial, ethnic minority groups, but that only covered the Philadelphia area, right? Southeastern Pennsylvania. Then that was expanded to the entire country. Any company that had a contract of $50,000 or more had to show progress toward hiring minority groups, but not women, not yet. Okay, that was, that's how things unfolded. Revised order number four out of the Labor Department said that women had to be included in that as well. So there you go, you start to see affirmative action picking up, and extraordinarily important to, we're talking about the public sector, we're talking about public contracts, if you will. What about the private sector? Nixon signs legislation in 1972 that expands the power of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to sue uh, companies guilty of discrimination or suspected of discrimination in court. And so that provides a means, again, to the application of affirmative action to private industry. So it's extremely important to see all of this going on. And then, you know, just to kind of conclude this a little bit, um, there are a whole range of legislation that Nixon signed 
during his presidency that embodied the principle of non-discrimination in the area of, of gender. So the EEOC law could be seen in that way that he signs in 1972. Uh, Title IX of the Educational Amendments of 1972, extraordinarily important. Um, uh, and then um, there's uh, expanding the charge of the Civil Rights Commission to include what was called at the time sex discrimination. So that's something that he signed. And he didn't sign this law, but he supported it, and President Ford signed it, um, the Equal Credit Act, so that women would have equal access to credit and would not have to you know, you know, go through their husbands. They could get a credit card, they could get a loan, so on and so forth. So, I mean, you get an awful lot of uh, very good and very important legislation. Uh, there were some shortcomings, maybe in the area of child care. Um, uh, it's, it's not a, from a, um, a second wave feminist perspective, it wouldn't necessarily be a perfect record. Nothing ever really is, of course. Um, but um, there was a lot of activity. And when Nixon talked about achievement and contribution, I mean, certainly this administration made its contributions to enhancing the ability of women to achieve. You mentioned uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, determination, actually, to appoint a woman to the Supreme Court. And they came up with, uh, they had a couple of candidates. And then it came up with a California judge, Mildred Lilly. And uh, he, uh, the, the process went, uh, began. And then it was uh, abruptly ended by the American Bar Association, uh, which found her unqualified. And the, uh, the qualification of that unqualified was that she was the most qualified woman lawyer available, and she was unqualified. So it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard, and I was around at the time, but it's hard for me to imagine how benighted we were. Um, Eleanor Holmes Norton, I think, had to sue Newsweek because they had a rule against hiring in 1970, uh, hiring women correspondents. It was, and as you say, until that Equal Opportunity Credit Act in 1974, women had to, to get a credit card, to get a loan, to get a mortgage, had to go through the, with their husband's approval. So it was quite uh, the, the, the context uh, in which this was all, in which Nixon was operating was something. And indeed, I think uh, the, the, uh, the, the opposition to the, the change that would be represented in a woman justice of the Supreme Court was so extreme that the Chief Justice uh, sent a letter of resignation that uh, he didn't specifically mention that as the reason, but he, his, he, he said that because of the changes, uh, I can't, uh, I don't think I can continue in this role. So uh, this was really groundbreaking stuff. Uh, John, so as uh, Dean has pointed out that Nixon used the approach of civil rights to a number of this, but there actually was some legislation and as I said, because of uh, Nixon uh, having uh, both houses of Congress against, uh, uh, controlled by the opposite, by the Democratic Party, uh, throughout his administration, the legislation was uh, 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 hard to do. Although, in the last days of that sort of last gasp of uh, bipartisanship, uh, he did get a number of uh, domestic legislation before politics became weaponized and toxic. Uh, he did get some things through the Democratic Congress. But the, the uh, John, who was present at the creation, working for uh, Pat Moynihan on the um, family assistance plan. So John, can you tell us something? Or actually, I think we have a picture. The, the pivotal to this is Pat Moynihan. And I think we have a, a picture of Pat Moynihan in the Oval Office with the President. Um, and John worked for and with Pat Moynihan on these uh, domestic uh, programs, and particularly the Family Assistance Plan and then the uh, Comprehensive Child uh, Development Act in 1971. So can you say, uh, tell us something about Pat Moynihan, about Nixon, and about the, this legislation? Thank you, Frank. And let me, if I could, go back to the beginning. And I have a picture from West Branch, Iowa in 1937, which was given to me by the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library. And if you can throw that one up of the family, the Richard Nixon family, 1937. 
They're driving home from North Carolina, where he had just completed law school at Duke. And you'll see over on the far, your far right, with the hat on, Hannah, his mother. And just sort of toward the middle from her, a very elderly woman, Almira, Richard Nixon's grandmother. I don't think this photo is really out in the, it's not downstairs, let's put it that way. And I can, I must tell you that there was an utterly profound impact on Nixon of the women in his family, of his mother and his grandmother. The grandmother, the Millhouse side, were folks in the Underground Railway helping slaves running away from the South during the war. Uh, and his mother was a, was a devout Quaker, and that led to a couple of things, more perhaps Nixon's conservative style, but he was a man living in the interior in so many ways. And you may recall, almost all of you may have heard the phrase, lower our voices or lower your voices from 68, which he picked up from someone in Eastern Ohio, a whistle stop, a girl carrying a placard, and used in his inaugural address. That was a quintessentially Quaker idea, lower your voices. But he also had, percolating away inside him, an impulse which was far more liberal and far more radical. But even that, I think, comes from his mother. Uh, Hannah was his mother again, and he imbibed from her and from her grit and purpose a foundational conviction that we cannot pass through the world without consciously and continuously working for the general good. What made Nixon a liberal is not quite secular. At the same time, he was born at an interesting moment. His mother was a progressive Republican. Richard Nixon was born a mere two months after Theodore Roosevelt had lost in the 1912 election to Woodrow Wilson and, his, uh, uh, and also his predecessor, or his successor, Taft. And so there was a, an atmosphere of progressive republicanism in the House. So all of this accounts for, if I, if I can then lead into legislation, not yet the ones Frank mentioned, but rather health care, health insurance. Because it was out of that context of his own family, of the death of two brothers to tuberculosis at a time of no health insurance, of course no uh, workman's comp, no unemployment benefits, no social security, that the family was imperiled financially. His mother had to go twice two successive times, each for one of her two sons who died of tuberculosis, to work uh, for their being able to be in a sanitarium by helping not just her own kids, but other patients. So Nixon grew up with this impulsion to, to do something about health care. He started as early as 1949. And this, again, I think, in his mind and in his interior had a lot to do with with the family, with the ability of a family at the edge to hold together. And he proposed in 1949 a national health insurance bill, along with Senator, later Senator Javits of New York and a couple of Republican U.S. Senators. That was a, a counter proposal to what Harry Truman was trying to do with a single payer, fully federal program at the time. And and comparing Nixon with the bulk of Republicans on the Hill who were more like the last decade saying, well, let's give a little money to the states and see what they would like to do with it. So that, that's the early background, the, the specifics in the administration. Family assistance plan was fascinating and it was a, an idea that had been percolating. It was a negative income tax, if you've ever heard of such a thing. It's just the mirror image of a, an income tax, i.e., if you have, if you're working, or if you're unemployed, or if you're dependent and poor, and if you have income below the poverty line, it would top up from the federal government. It would top up what you have as take home and the ability to take care of your family. And that was a negative income tax. It was also basically a guaranteed income. And both these ideas were toxic. They had no political traction, though there was bipartisan support in the electoral community for them, Milton Friedman on one side, all Johnson and Kennedy's CEA folks on the other. 
And so one wag in the department of HEW, knowing how toxic the terms were, put in front of Secretary Finch the cover title for the bill that his folks were proposing. And it was the Christian working man's anti-communist national defense rivers and harbors bill of 1969. And it was sent along with a somewhat different caption to the president later. But it, it was a long drawn out battle and uh, Nixon did get one piece of it which was profoundly important to women. There had been as part of his family assistance plan a so-called adult categories piece which became something called SSI, Supplemental Security Income. And the old age assistance part of that dramatically impacted women because think about it, think about the demographics at that time. Far and away, the largest percentage of poor people were women. And so it disproportionately benefited women. Um, the, the other thing which we should think about is SNAP, which was Nixon's food stamp idea. And it became law. These were the only two pieces of Nixon's great initiatives, his health insurance bill of 71 and his FAP overall, uh, that became law. S the SNAP or food stamp plan reached millions, tens of millions of families, and is a pure negative income tax. It is one of the most pure uh, that's out there. And so he did have success in that, and it is to, to this day is helping people, men and women, feed their families and themselves. So uh, there was that. But then you had uh, another year later, things, the storm clouds that began to gather about FAP. And the right wing just was having none of it. Uh, and Reagan mounted a, a very serious offense against the family assistance plan. Nixon asked me to do the briefing paper for him when he was to meet with Reagan in August of 69, and then invited me to the meeting with the, where Nixon was trying to sell Governor Reagan on embracing his idea of a uniform family assistance plan which put a floor under the family income of every family with kids in the country. And I felt we were in San Clemente in, in his office out there. And there I was at the sea level and with, I could see the surfers out on the waves. But what I felt was that I was at the top of a continental divide. And with Nixon, it was still the activist, I want to use government to help people. With Reagan, it was government's the enemy and let's detach from it. And so I, f I felt these, these streams flowing in totally different directions. And Reagan mounted a very very steady assault on it. He gave his welfare guy, Bob Carlson, to Senator Long to help kill it in the Senate Finance Committee. But uh, the intersection of the resistance to family assistance plan and the Comprehensive Child Development Act, I'd like just to spend a moment on, because the Comprehensive Child Development Act uh, had an echo in the State of the Union r recently. And it was for a very, very significant expenditure on early child care, not custodial, the, the jargon goes not custodial, but transformative uh, in every respect. And that was a, embraced in a bipartisan way in 1971. Walter Mondale on the, on the Senate side, uh, later Reagan's opponent, um, embraced it, and on the, the House side, you had Ogden Reed from New York and, and John Bradamus, Democrat of Ohio, and they passed quite overwhelmingly, passed both houses. But Nixon then, after a lot of reflection and a heck of a lot of lobbying, vetoed it. Why? What was the context? Again, Nixon had FAP out front. Family assistance plan had a child care component. It was restricted, however, to the roughly 315,000 women with children who were in the welfare system. And he proposed a $610 million program for daycare for those families to enable those women to find work. So it, it is not as though he was opposed to any kind of daycare, but what was happening was by this time the drumbeat had gotten horrendous on the right against Nixon's family assistance plan. That was compounded by his announcement he would go to Red China, 
ultimately to uh, engage with them, and that there was rumblings of Spiro Agnew going off the ticket. And in May coming up, May, Nixon was about to go to Moscow and negotiate the SALT-1 agreement. So this, this drove his friends on the right to, to lunacy. And they were working as hard as they could to beat it. Uh, a guy named Alan Riskind was the owner and editor of Human Events, one of the main right wing journals. And he and I were fighting for, for several years while Nixon was proposing FAP. He and I later became good friends thanks to the Marx Brothers. Uh, his dad was Maury Riskind, who wrote the screenplays for most of the Marx Brothers movies. And young Alan, as a child, for his birthday parties, would have all the Marx Brothers over. So, but we be, over that we became friends. But, but uh, Alan told me that FAP was the bone in his throat and that for most of the, of the right wing. Pat Buchanan said to me, it was Moby Dick. It had to be slain. So Nixon was trying to get FAP over the finish line, facing this opposition, and the Manhattan 12, which was the group of the conservative groups, were dead against it, mounting a primary campaign against him. So uh, it was doomed, except for that supplemental security income piece, to failure. Sorry, that was lengthy, but Hope it was helpful. Uh, one of the interesting, many interesting th things in your book, The Last Liberal Republican, I thought, was uh, how you document how Nixon pursued FAP. Uh, I think there's a, f a, f a feeling, a critical feeling, that he, you know, he proposed it and then was just let it uh, wither. Uh, but he, he, he kept going back with it. Just one, one, one or two more sentences. Steve Bell, who was a leading conservative person on the Hill, and uh, wrote in 73, I think it was, after FAP had been left behind. He said, for two years and even much of a third year, Richard Nixon and his administration worked not incompetently and steadily to try and pass FAP. He said, I am so relieved. I've been so unhappy the last couple of years. Now, for the first time, I don't see FAP in the budget. Thank God. Susan, we were going to come back to some of the women in the uh, administration and uh, in politics at the time. What is, what is there to add now? Um, well, I don't think much would have happened in terms of women's rights had it not been for uh, really a handful, 20, maybe 30, uh, and mostly professional women who were pushing Nixon. These four congresswomen, for example, um, as, you know, as soon as he was inaugurated, they wanted a meeting with him, and they had to ask a couple of times. Um, and they finally got a meeting with him after Vera Glasser had challenged him on the low number of women's appointments. And, and they, they went to the meeting in, in July of 69. They handed a sheet of paper to reporters as they went into the White House, and, which was heavily critical of the administration and and even called some of the uh, of Nixon's advisors uh, positively anti-women. Um, so they had a, a long chat with uh, President Nixon <clears throat> and shortly thereafter he appointed that task force on women's rights and responsibilities and that that was really critical. It was mostly Republicans, <clears throat> mostly women, but um, they kind of got each other going. Uh, you know, they, they told other women about the kinds of discrimination that they faced or they saw. Their consciousness was raised, in other, in other words. It was, I mean, that came out of left feminism, consciousness raising. But the task force was really a melting pot of, of, um, of uh, consciousness raising. And, and, and the recommendations were widespread. Um, that, you know, they, they really, um, covered a lot of ground, including a child care um, program. Um, and, and so there they sat there. This came out of Nixon's own committee, and okay, why aren't we getting action on it? So <clears throat> I just think that had a tremendous impact. And um, Vera Glaser, uh, for example, was on the committee, and she said, you know, after it was over, the task force, um, boy, a year ago, I never thought I'd be so militant um, as, you know, as, as after, after I've done this. Um, 
And, and the other thing about Vera Glasser, there, and there's a really a nice exhibit outside if you haven't looked at it yet, um, which isn't mentioned, is that in the fall of, of 1969, after she had raised the issue with Nixon, she wrote a five-part series called The Women's Revolt, and it was, it was the first sustained and also serious media coverage of the growing women's movement, and it was syndicated. It ran in probably 40 newspapers all across the country. So that was a real uh, benefit for this emerging women's movement. And uh, Florence Dwyer, the oldest uh, Republican woman in Congress, she had it inserted into the uh, congressional record. Um, so it was women like these. Let me just mention one more, um, Rita Hauser is an example of a bunch of uh, professional women who worked for women's campaigns. She headed his campaign in 1968 in New York State. She got rewarded with an appointment to the UN Commission on Human Rights. And early in his administration, she's on him about, she's sending a memoranda to his aides saying, we have got to do action on, on women's rights, not just appoint, appointments, but also policies and executive orders, and, and they hear from her again and again. And, and so there were more of these women who came out of these professions when they were just a tiny minority, um, but, um, but out of that experience, they put what I consider to be the vital precedent, um, pressure on Nixon and his advisors. Vera Glasser is interesting, uh, in addition to what you've described. She, uh, Mrs. Nixon, asked her for a list of uh, women nominees for the court, which she gave to Mrs. Nixon, and she passed along uh, to the president. So it's also the power of one. Uh, we have uh, Vera Glasser raising this issue about the women appointees and then all this reaction to it. And similarly, at the very beginning of his administration, Mary Lasker, who was the uh, uh, a cancer activist and philanthropist, uh, took full page ads in a number of newspapers, including the Washington uh, Post and the New York Times, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. And that was really the thing that, uh, that dislodged what became the war on cancer, although that was a phrase he never used because he felt it might be misleading and he was more interested in research. But the power of one person, the power of one woman to, to affect national policy is uh, seen in Nixon. We've uh, we have so much more to talk about and we have so little time. Uh, John Mitchell uh, famously said uh, that, you, that, that you should, about the administration, that you should, should watch what we do, not what we say. And uh, Len Garment, who was uh, Nixon's uh, law partner, friend, uh, White House advisor, um, wrote that Nixon's enforcement of civil rights, and this is Len's quote, was for the most part operationally progressive but obscured by clouds of retrogressive rhetoric. In 1973, President Nixon wrote, when the historical record of the first four years is written, I am confident it will show that this administration did far more in the fields of civil rights and equal opportunity than its critics were willing to admit. Panel, do you think Nixon's confidence was uh, well placed? Well, it certainly was in the area of women's policies. I mean, that was the heyday of women's policy making those years um, when he was was he was president, and you know some of that was just timing when everything kind of came together, but part of it was his in his um, administration's willingness to entertain this pressure from women. Uh, Dean, in your book, you say. Uh, you say, in 1972, Newsweek could say without sarcasm, as you say, uh, and then the quote, the person in Washington who has done the most for women's movement may be Richard Nixon. Uh, to go around the panel, the, the classic question, were women better off in 1974 than they were in 1969? Abigail, do you want to? I think if you're going by numbers and metrics, yes, uh, there's very... Uh, you can't really deny the strides that had been made during that time period. But once again, as uh, Susan pointed out too, not just due to the administration, but due to pressure and outside and women's groups and things like that. Um, 
So always more progress could be made, but I mean, they certainly made a good start. John? No illumination on this. <laughs> Dean? Just to go back to those to go back to those quotes that you read, um, I would agree because I, I quoted both of those in my book. So um, I, I do think that if you, you know, just again, the, the kind of the bottom line and the balance sheet, um, uh, a lot of progress in these areas, a context where these movements, African American rights, women's rights, American Indian rights, um, and you had an administration that was, was willing to listen and was willing to act in part, as I mentioned, out of principle, practical considerations. One of the practical considerations that we could add is that all over the globe, um, we had movements in various different countries. I'm studying Australia, and a sense that you needed to save the existing political order and system by making accommodations. It's extraordinarily important, and I think that practical consideration was there. And also the politics, we would hear and we would see in the documents this cropping up about how Nixon at one point said, we need to grab the ball on the whole, this whole women's business and show that women are thinking of the politics. But in, in a way, I mean, that's very political, it's very practical, but in a, in a way it's very progressive because it is acknowledging that women are part of you know, the, the body politic and that attention must be paid. And I think that that's extraordinarily important. And you know, looking at all the different motivations and things he's said at a given point and, and another point, Looking at the whole record is extraordinarily important. Susan, you had the first word, you have the last word. <clears throat> well, I, I think um, in answer to your question, absolutely, women were a lot better off. But I think we should use a, a, a qualifier here and say that women who were positioned in terms of material well-being, education, who were positioned to take advantage of these new rights and these new enforcements of rights were the ones who really gained. And I think what was left to take care of after, um, after the Nixon administration, and, and to some extent still is, um, is the well-being of poor women, of women of color, of women who do not have the advantages that all of us in this room um, have had. Well, as Tamara Martin said, there are 46 million sheets of paper and all those things downstairs. So uh, it's 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 a it's a, it's a uh, an embarrassment of riches for people who want to pursue the uh, subject. In the meantime, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Abigail, Susan, Dean, and John for a terrific panel. Thank you.